Two summers ago, we took all of our family to, to uh, Universal. Uh, and uh, as I walked into the park, I'm a, I'm a lover of roller, sco roller coasters, but I saw one that really made me uneasy. I think it's called the rocket or something. And anyway, you go straight up, straight up. And of course, uh, grandkids with me, and come on, Grandpa, we're gonna go, go, on, go on this. And I, I like roller coasters. I said, okay, I'll go on it. And as soon as we started to go straight up, I thought to myself, what is a 70-year-old man doing on this thing? And boy, when it went straight down, I was terrified. And I, I confess, I did not look. And a lot of times, like when I ride the Magnum at Cedar Point, I'll look, that's a cool view up there. But boy, I had my eyes shut tight, and it was a terrifying ride down, and then all the rest of it too. And when I got off, I said to myself, nope, I'm not riding this again. The kids can, but I have had it, that's it. Now, if you've ever had an experience like that where you did something and were terrified and said, nope, this is not going to happen again, you kind of know what was in the mind of the Israelites uh, as they had gathered at Mount Horeb or Mount Sinai, as you probably know it otherwise. See, they'd been told God's coming down for visit. You think, wow, God's coming to visit us? Yeah, this is the God who made the, made the Egyptians cry uncle after he put the, put the plagues on them all. This is the God who opened the Red Sea and let us go through straight. Yeah, this God's coming down to visit us. And everybody gathers around and thinks, wow, this is going to be great. But as that epiphany takes place, one thing becomes very clear to them. The desire to stand in God's presence, the desire to see God face to face was really a wrong-headed, bad eye Dear, as nature erupts on that mountain, as the voice thunders forth, the people stand around and they get terrified and, and they cry out to Moses and Moses says, I'm trembling in fear too. And the thought comes to mind, what were we thinking? Because it has become very obvious that this God is an alien a true, honest, alien being. That, in the sense of the word, he is other. He is completely other than us. We have no point of reference the way we do with one another. This God has more power than we have ever seen or could imagine being seen. This God is of superior intelligence. And far worse, this God is our moral superior. And that means he has the perfect right and the perfect ability to judge and condemn every one of our thoughts, every one of our deeds, every one of our words that displease him. And if we make any attempt to rationalize it, any attempt to explain away what we've done wrong, when he calls us to account, we're going to fail. And if we try to defend ourselves by saying, yeah, what I did was pretty bad, but hey, look at that guy over there. What he or she did was ten times worse than what I've done. Well, God's just going to laugh at us because unlike many of our teachers in our school systems, God doesn't grade on the curve. So now, far from satisfying our curiosity by seeing this God, now... We want to run away from his presence. We don't want to be near him. Like the Israelites, we're looking for caves. We're looking for cliffs. We're looking for something to hide ourselves. And we hope that, please, go back where you came from and let us live our lives in peace. And this revelation, this epiphany was so terrifying that like Israel, they cried out, we're not going to hear this voice anymore. We are not going to see this fire. We, are, we shall not die. That's it. Much to our surprise and relief, God agrees with that demand. What they've said is good. You bet. This is good. Those very words of God bring another revelation about himself. And that even though he is terrifying, by his experience, by his presence. Nevertheless, he is a very merciful God. He has pity 
upon our fear and so makes a special arrangement on that point. And so from their journey from Mount Horeb all the way to the Promised Land, God speaks only to Moses. What they said is good. It's not going to happen anymore. And so Moses, or God speaks to Moses, Moses speaks to God, and, God's, and then Moses speaks to the people. And so communication between them and God is carried out. But then another circumstance arises. They get to the point where Moses calls the people and says, um, I'm not going to be able to go with you into the promised land. And the thought arises, I'm sure, in many of their minds, wait a minute, if you're not going, does that mean we're going to have to endure another one of these terrifying sound and light shows every time God wants to direct us? We said we can't, we're not going to stand for that. We can't endure it. And Moses says to the people, it's okay. God has made a provision. God is going to raise up a prophet like me from among your midst. He's the one you should listen to. He's going to be the mediator. He's going to do what I did for you. And so once again, God reveals his kindness and mercy. Now at the same time as this reading from Deuteronomy actually takes us back to this mountain and gives us an experience of it, same way that the people who sit around the table at the Passover are taken back to the original Passover and are participants in that. So when we stand around the mountain and heard that read this morning, it's like we were there. We heard their fear. We saw what it frightened them. And so it is a terrifying thing, but we're blessed to know something that they didn't know because the book of Deuteronomy hadn't been completely written yet. And if you turn to the last chapter of Deuteronomy, you find a paragraph that's clearly not written by Moses. It was added later on because the writer says this, to this day, there has not arisen in Israel a prophet like Moses whom the Lord knew face to face, who did all those miraculous signs and wonders the Lord sent him to do in Egypt. So whatever time this guy wrote this, he had been around a while and some history of Israel had taken place and he looks back on it and says, the promise has still gone unfulfilled. What God promised to send us, it still hasn't happened. And these people lived through the ministry of Elijah and Elisha, of Isaiah and Jeremiah, of Ezekiel and Daniel and all the rest. And even then, the people still had this lingering feeling uh, yeah, they were okay, but they, God still hasn't fulfilled that promise. We're still awaiting its fulfillment. And so that's by the time the New Testament era comes around, up pops this guy in the wilderness who's drawing a crowd, and the people go out to meet him, and some go up to him and say, are you the prophet? Are you the one we've been waiting for ever since way back when? And John the baptizer disappoints them in saying, no, nope, it's not I. I'm not that prophet. Several years later, however, Peter speaks to a crowd and tells them that prophecy has been fulfilled. It's been fulfilled in Jesus. God literally raised him up. Great play on words. Raised him up from the dead. And his power and miracles were just as good as those Moses did. And he teaches with authority and he drives out demons, and his prophecies came true. And so John's Gospel says, you know, if, if, God saw, if Moses saw God face to face, well, that's one thing, but Jesus is always at the side of the Father. If the law came through Moses, grace and truth have come to us by Jesus in his death and resurrection. So what does all this mean for our relationship to this God, whose presence caused fear and trembling, and who out of pure mercy told Moses, I'm sorry, I can't let you see my literal face, because if you saw it, you'd be dust. You would die as soon as you did. We still need a mediator. We still need one to stand for us, because we are still sinners. 
Jesus, knowing our every weakness, comes before God and pleads on our behalf just the same way Moses did for the rebels of his day. Our sins are forgiven on account of Jesus mediating actions between us and his Father and because of his death and resurrection. And that trust in his office as our mediator informs our fear of God. It doesn't remove it. I always laugh whenever I hear songs that say, Lord, we want to see your presence. We want to see you face to face. And I'm thinking, oh, no, you don't. You do not want that. You don't know what you're asking because that's only going to happen in heaven. And if you want that to happen in before heaven, you're going to be shot to pieces because you cannot endure that. No one can endure it. And that's why we need a mediator even to this day. Yes, God is our creator and our judge. Yes, he still calls us to account for the wrongs that we do against him and our neighbors. And as Paul says, we must all stand before the judgment seat of God and give an account. Yes, as the New Testament tells us, it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. And as Peter asks in his first letter, if the judgment begins with the house of God, where is it going to end? If the righteous are scarcely saved, what's going to happen to those who disobey the gospel? Yes, it is appropriate for us to fear God and not use the word reverence, not use those other words in place. When the Bible talks about the fear of the Lord, it talks about something like I experienced on that roller coaster, only 10 times worse, where the hair stands up on the back of your head. It is fear, but that's not God's last word. Those words are tempered with these from the New Testament. If anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. He appeared, the final revelation, the real epiphany, so that he might take away our sins. And because he has purified you from your sins, you have the confidence to stand before God who, yes, is our creator, but now even more, he is our redeemer. But guess what? Even though the Israelites stood before that fiery mountain in fear, they also knew this was not for their destruction. The God of Abraham and Jacob and Isaac would continue to act on their behalf because he had made a promise to them. Despite their fears, their faith and that promise gave them the confidence to say, we're not going to see this great fire anymore. We're not going to hear this voice anymore. We shall not die. And our faith in the crucified Messiah gives us the confidence to believe that something greater than fear of God's alien presence is here. Jesus' appearance, his epiphany in our world gives us a confidence to believe that God really is for us, not against us. Yes, we too must stand before the judgment seat and give an account, but we're not going to stand there alone. Alongside us is going to be standing our advocate, our mediator, Jesus Christ the righteous. And so because he has said, whoever lives and believes in me will never die, you and I have the confidence to say the very same words that those Israelites said, we shall not die. We shall not die because the revelation of an empty tomb guarantees it. Amen.